Let's pray as uh, we get into the message. Holy Father, loving Savior, sweet Spirit of peace, we love you today. We seek your wisdom. We seek your message, your word, your blessing, Father. We need it every day. In the next few moments, Lord, I pray that your heart, your message, and your love would be heard in this place. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Question number one. Just going to jump right into it. Yeah, Toby. Got some trend. Can we go with black? And let's go with red. I hear that's a good one. Black and red. Our trained microphone technicians here. Over the last few weeks, I have been looking a little more intimately at the family of Jesus, uh, the growing experience, and last week uh, talked a little bit specifically about what we can learn from his father, Joseph. Today, I'm uh, looking forward to talking about Mary. Uh, Some of these I may have asked before. Mary is a New Testament version of what Old Testament name? Now, if I don't call one of these young men over here, the church may explode. So, uh, Isaiah, go ahead. Murph? That's very close. I like it. You're getting there, but maybe Eric will help out. E, Myrtle. You think Myrtle? That is not correct, but that's a good choice. All right. Let's have uh, Julian have a chance here. What do you think, Julian? Uh, Deep. Deep Mara. Mar was the name that Naomi, in the book of Ruth, when her life was bitter, she said, no longer call me Naomi, call me Mara, because Mara means bitter, but it's not Mara either. All right, uh, well, Dylan is right here. Let's get Dylan a chance. A. Dylan says A, and I'm going to just let one more try. Ryan, what do you say here, sir? A. All right, we've got confirmation in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let everything be established. It is A. Miriam. I don't quite know how it derived from Miriam to Mary. I'm sure there's some uh, language cultural adaptation, but in the New Testament, Mary is the Greek uh, way of referring to Miriam. Miriam may be the most important uh, Old Testament women uh, that ever lived. They revered Mary or Miriam in, in the New Testament time. That's why so many ladies uh, were named Miriam. Uh, she was respected for helping her brother uh, survive uh, the Nile uh, and be a, uh, saved, and, and then her leadership qualities and, and helping with Moses and the deliverance of Israel. So Miriam is whose Mary's name is based off of. What did Mary do after agreeing to carry Jesus in her womb? Do you remember in the story, she says, yes to Gabriel, uh, let it be unto me as you have said. And then right after that, the Bible makes it very clear in the Gospel of Luke, almost immediately she she flees Dodge, and she does something. Where did, she went somewhere. Who knows? Ketsia, I'm not going to fall into this trap again. I'm sorry. (laughs) You're cheating back there. Any of the young people? All right. um, Oh, yeah. uh, 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 Wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. D, 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 Very good. It wasn't her sister. It was a relative. So we're just going to go with that. She goes off to visit Elizabeth, all right? And in that moment, you have this remarkable event that takes place. As, as soon as the Bible says almost when she walks over the threshold of the door, basically, the Bible says that Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit. And John, in her womb at six months gestation, is also filled with the Holy Spirit. Amazing. And uh, Elizabeth makes this great proclamation, and then Mary sings a song. She sings a song. She offers a hymn or a song. Now, remember, Mary's a descendant of David, right? The great psalm writer, the great musician David. And, and Mary seems to have carried that genetic ability with her. And so when she sings, it's as though the continuation of that ministry uh, of, that started with David flows through her lips. And we're going to look at her song a little bit later in the service. So thank you, Dale. Delia. Delia. All right. We're going to work on it. Good job. 
after, uh, there are three significant mentions of Mary in the New Testament after his baptism. And I say significant, there are some very brief references, I'm, I'm not looking for those, but there are three significant times we see Mary after his baptism. They're in these three places in the Bible, and I want to see if any of the young people can identify where Mary appears. I see Eric's hand. Boys, we're going to let some others try, all right? I understand. I love you. You know I do. Eric, Eric's going to help us out. Just name one of them if you could. Well, this isn't a choice, so I may have thrown you there. Do you remember the story itself, like what was happening? Okay, that, think about it. What, what are those mentions? All right, Julian, thank you. A. <laughs> so I thought, yeah, okay, help, parents, help me out here. <laughs> what happened in A, Julian? Do you remember? No. <laughs> I know your dad whispered something to you. I don't think he said no. <laughs> All right, young people, what happened in John 2 or what happened in John 19 or Acts 1 where we see Mary, Jesus' mother? All right, I guess we're going to have to come to to our young men over here. This is for all the kids. I don't want to leave anyone out. Boys, are you looking it up? That's fine. All right, Owen. Thank you, Nassim. I can't spend all morning on the this. Wedding. The wedding. Thank you, Owen. John chapter 2 is the wedding at Cana. And here you see Jesus and his mother interacting. This is probably the first miracle of Jesus. Uh, they run out of wine in the wedding, right? And Mary says this to Jesus, and Jesus kind of resists and says, why are you telling me this? This is not my time. And then Mary says, do, she says to the servants, whatever he says, do it. Now, what I find significant about this is we have no previous recorded miracles of Jesus. We don't. Now, maybe he did. Maybe before the wedding, Jesus was just off doing all kinds of miracles that Mary was like, I know he can do it. But if that's not the case, it's remarkable that Mary understood that Jesus had the power to solve this problem and where she may never have seen it before. Her decision by faith to accept that Jesus could address the problem. And it's very similar when, when she accepts the call of Gabriel and says, let it be unto me as you have said. She kind of says that in, a, in a, a similar way to the servants. Whatever he says, do it. So it's a significant story. Mary kind of helps launch the ministry. Jesus had recently been baptized. Mary hears about that baptism, and she's excited to see that her son is moving in this direction. And then at the wedding, she kind of challenges him it's time for you to reveal yourself. He doesn't do that publicly, but the marriage. Okay, John 19, what's happening in that, young people? Do any of you know? John 19, where, where is Mary found there? Anyone that wants to help? I, Ryan, I really thought you'd be with me on this, man. I, <laughs> Gloria, where are you? You guys are feeling all right about this? All right, I see Jaden over here, so we're going to come to uh, the Osinia on this side. At the cross. Okay. <laughs> Don't let Ezekiel touch it anymore, please. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. just kidding. So yes, that very significant moment, Jesus hanging from the cross, and it says that he looks down and he sees Mary. So she's there at the beginning, and she's there at the end, and probably she was there in many other places, um, even if we don't always read of that. And then the last one, Acts chapter 1, what is going on there? This is the last time we read of Mary in the New Testament. Do you remember what's happening in Acts chapter 1? I didn't mean this to be so tricky. <clears throat> Parents, you know, you can help and help us out here so we're not stuck too long. All right, Owen, I appreciate your, your willingness. Owen's going to help us out here. What's happening? Pentecost. Thank you. That is right. So these three uh, events are there. The marriage at Cana, the cross, the upper room. Okay, one more question. One more question. Somewhat rhetorical, but I'd, Mary's story may be brief in salvation history, but her example of faith is timeless. Who else does the Bible say should have Jesus Christ in them like Mary did? It's kind of interesting. I think even Mr. Heisey would be struggling with this one. That's a tough one. I'm just going to give it to you. Are you ready?
Kids, did you know that? Kind of. (laughs) Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. I hope to talk about that a little bit more, what it means that Christ is in you. We can debate this. I'm, I'm happy to disagree. I'm happy to have other opinions. Happy to hear your thoughts on this reality or not. And over the last couple of weeks, I've talked about how in 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 the, in the medieval church and both Orthodox and Catholic traditions, they tended to elevate Mary higher than what we would be comfortable in our Protestant uh, upbringing. They tended to you know escalate her beyond what Scripture or even theology would be reasonable to us in our sola scriptura Protestant way of thinking. They make Mary. Uh, nearly a god, okay, in the, in the, in the classic church. Mary is easily the second or, or, or the third most prayed to being on the planet earth. Jesus is probably first, without a doubt, more Christians, and even other religions will, will meditate on or somewhat appeal to Jesus. Allah and Islam is probably number two, but if you consider there's a billion Muslims in the world and there's a billion Catholics, and there's a good portion of even non-Catholic Christian uh, groups that do revere and pray to Mary. So it's kind of a a jump ball between Allah and Mary as being the second most prayed to individual. And um, uh, so we've looked at that and we've we've, we've respectfully declined the uh, the medieval and and, uh, the Catholic presentation of Mary uh, being immaculately conceived uh, a lot of Protestants don't understand when, when we talk about the, 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 the church, the Catholic church teaches that Mary, uh, in the Immaculate Conception of Mary, they're not talking about Jesus being miraculously conceived in Mary. They're talking about Mary was miraculously conceived in her mother's womb, um, St. Anna. And not only is the teaching of her being conceived in her mother's womb, but that she was born without original sin which nearly, now the Catholic dogma and catechism won't go so far to say it, but in all practical terms, it would suggest that Mary was sinless. And that in, in many uh, other Orthodox and classical and Catholic teachings, she takes on this far greater role than we as Protestants are comfortable with in our study of Scripture. So we respectfully say, now she's very important, but we would, de- you know, we would depart from that. But there is a tendency in the Protestant world to go too far the other way. And sometimes in our desire to be un-Catholic, we go too far to being uh, this side of, of Christianity, and we sometimes miss out on beautiful biblical teachings that, that are consistent with the Bible. Uh, and so sometimes we want to relegate Mary, well, she was just a nice little girl, and she did some nice little things, and we can appreciate that, but there's really not that great of specialness to her. And I, I just, in, in my study of, of, of the life of Christ and of Mary, I see a much more dynamic and beautiful picture that we can appreciate about the role that Mary played. And I would present to you, and I don't twist your arm on it, that I think she probably is the most important human being, separate from Christ, that's ever lived. And I think we can gain blessings from at least trying to, to look at it with greater uh, uh, clarity and intensity. The Bible says, when the fullness of time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman. Now, every life, as we have talked about, even in Mila's dedication, is not accidental. It is planned. It is purposeful. Um, but there's sometimes in, in my, uh, uh, my evaluation or my study or my, my discussions with people, there's kind of this idea that when the fullness of time came, God kind of looked at His prophetic time watch and said, hey, Gabriel, my goodness, it is time for Jesus to be born. Let me see who who, what do you think about her, Gabriel? Is that going to, oh, not her? All right. And then it was kind of this happenstance or this somewhat, uh, you know, uh, uh, last minute decision that God just looked for someone to bear uh, Jesus and be the surrogate for. Um, Mary was as defined and planned and purposeful as any life is today, and particularly as any key uh, prophetic person would be. From Adam and Eve, to Abraham and Sarah, and then from David and Bathsheba, God had 
a plan for Mary. God saw in his wisdom and in his plan, he knew that she would come on the scene. He was not choosing her arbitrarily. This was not an accident. God had been laying the foundation and framework for his Incarnation, I lost the word there for a second. For his incarnation to come through her, it was not an accident. God knew as she was coming into this world that she would be the one destined to have this honor and this priority of bearing Jesus Christ in her womb. When the fullness of time came, she was ready, God was ready. It was the plan of God that this would happen. She comes along as God had prescribed and design. Now, in this passage, just to, to just to try to look at the person of Mary a little bit more, there's uh, some elements that can be evaluated. From Isaiah, he says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Now, Isaiah does not use the technical word virgin here. Virgin can be the meaning of this word, but it can also mean young woman or maiden. Uh, it can mean women who were not virgins. Okay, so it's not wrong that it could be a virgin, but it doesn't have to be a virgin. Okay, however, when Matthew and Luke refer to this passage, or when Matthew quotes Isaiah, in the Greek, he uses the specific word for virgin. And Luke, when he refers to Mary, and he calls her a virgin, he uses the specific word that she was a virgin. Now, this is important. Some people want to debate, you know, the reality or the possibility of miracles, and they want to look at Isaiah and say, it doesn't have to be this way, and I don't have time to go into talking about all the purposes of that. What I'm trying to illustrate now is if it is true, what we believe is that she was a virgin, as was understood by the times of the first century church, it tells us something likely about her age. We don't know this for sure. We cannot, uh, you know, uh, it's not a thus saith the Lord, but if all the cultural customs are in place at this time, she is very young, younger than we would probably perceive or be comfortable with our daughters today being pregnant. It would not be unusual by any stretch of the imagination. It was not unusual in the first century for girls as young as 12 to be betrothed. That would not be unusual. It's not the norm. Okay, but it's not unusual. Betrothal is slightly different. I'll talk about that in a second. However, it would be unusual for a young girl to wait until she was 20 or for the family to wait until the early 20s to uh, establish the contract of betrothal. It would have been remarkable. And the very fact that the scriptures do not remark beyond her presence as a virgin would suggest that she fit the common model of when a young woman would be betrothed and married. She was likely or nearly certainly a teenager. A teenager. Okay? Again, I don't force this upon you. You may feel differently about it. But as best we can ascertain, looking back even into the early church fathers and what little uh, has been recorded and has been, been accepted historically, she was young. She was young. But that was normal. That was not a... Uh, 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 a scandal or anything back then. Uh, betrothal, by the way, is kind of in between engagement and marriage in, in how we do things today. Today, you get engaged. Most people do if you're going to do a traditional marriage. You get engaged, you plan the wedding, you have the wedding, you're married. In the Hebrew custom, they had kind of an intermediate phase called a betrothal. A betrothal was a legal, formal contract. It was something that was established. As a matter of fact, when Matthew, or excuse me, in Matthew, when Joseph finds out before they're married that Mary is pregnant, he says, it says him being a righteous man, he sought to put her away quietly. That's kind of a metaphor for divorce. Had that marriage or had that betrothal broken at that time, Mary would have been considered a divorced woman, Okay. So betrothal was more than engagement, but it was not quite marriage. And the purpose of betrothal, usually lasted about a year, was simple. A wedding was a big deal. It took a lot of time to prepare. You had to contact relatives. The, the husband had to use the bride price to start building his house or establishing his, his honeymoon chamber, uh, you know, uh, getting all of the festivities together for a wedding, arranging transportation. If, if, uh, if cousin Jedediah was in harvest season, he needed time to, to wrap that up so he could come to the wedding. So betrothals were part of the formal process of getting married. And so Mary was betrothed to Joseph, and she had not yet come to the full point of marriage. 
She married, she's betrothed as a virgin. She's a young girl. I want you just to think about that for a second. Jesus, the Lord God entrusted the infant pregnancy of Jesus to a teenage girl. Hallelujah. <laughs> Man. Any understanding of Mary devoid of her song is going to be lacking and is going to be limited. I don't have it in the screen, um, but if you want to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 1, um, I think it's important that we look at what Mary says after her visit to Elizabeth, after she has become pregnant with Jesus. I'm going to read quickly the opening uh, words here. Um, after the angel has left her, it says in verse 39 of Luke chapter 1, at this time Mary arose and went to the hill country, to the hill, to, the, uh, to a city of Judah, and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, previous to this, it talks about how John would be filled with the Holy Spirit even in the womb of Elizabeth. She cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Of your womb. And how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? Speaking to this teenage girl. For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leapt in my womb for joy. And blessed is he who believe, uh, she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what the Lord had spoken to her, uh, fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. Then Mary opens up her mouth. The Holy Spirit working through her, she sings a song. She is obviously very knowledgeable in the Scriptures, and I, I know the Holy Spirit can do things beyond the natural, but I don't think it's the norm of the Holy Spirit to uh, endow uh, you know, knowledge beyond what is uh, possible for her to understand. She, again, as a descendant of David, she will appeal greatly to the Psalms in this song, but you're also going to hear the words of Hannah from 1 Samuel, and you're also going to hear some echoes of Deborah from the song of Deborah and Barak in Judges chapter 5. And I want to read through her song with you this morning because, again, I think if you're going to understand who Mary is, you have to read and study her song. And Mary said, my soul exalts or magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. This is almost exactly the beginning of Hannah's song as well in 1 Samuel. Verse 48, for he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. Did you hear what I read, Protestant church? She says, for behold, that's an imperative. It's imper an imperative is a command. It is imperative that you behold. It's imperative that you understand. And then she follows it with an indicative, a statement of fact. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. We know that the Holy Spirit has to be doing this because that's a very arrogant statement if you're not saying it uh, through the working of the, of the Holy Spirit. But moved by the Spirit of God, she speaks from her mouth that which would be the case according to the plan of God. It is our, uh, 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 our privilege to respect and honor the blessed Mary. All generations will count me blessed. Now, that doesn't mean she wasn't counted blessed in her generation because of her, her circumstance, but every generation that would appeal or know or have the faith of God and understand what God was doing and understand what God was doing in Mary's life will look upon her and consider her blessed. I know of no other statement in all of Scripture where a similar sentiment is shared about a human being. There are close. Israel is supposed to be blessed forever. The house of David is supposed to be blessed forever. I know of no other statement like this in all of the Bible where a human individual speaking from the Holy Spirit says, this role that God has given me, behold, it's imperative. It's imperative that the work of God through the life of Mary be regarded as one of the most blessed moments in all of history. She goes on to say, for the mighty one, 
Very interesting. Only about a dozen times in the Bible is God called the mighty one, mostly in the Psalms and Isaiah. But she chooses that, that idea. The mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name, his mercies upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. Oh, wait, I wanted to... This is what happens sometimes when you don't write your notes down and you just... Uh, so, Tammy, you can hold me accountable here. I want you to understand something that I don't think is devoid from this song and from what the plan of God was doing in the life of Mary and what the purpose of that inspirational statement is there, right there at the beginning of her, uh, of her prayer and her song. From the time of the fall, okay? Now, this is a theology for another time and place. But from the time of the fall, it is clear and taught in Scripture that we are uh, affected by the curse of sin because of the sin of Adam, because of a man's sin, the sin of Adam. But Scripture equally throws a shade of shame on women because it was Eve who was deceived first. And it was Eve whose deception led to Adam's sin and which wise both of their eyes were open. And whether it is, is, it is uh, appropriate or not, whether it is uh, taught in the Bible or not, there had been a cultural perception that salvation could not come from a woman. It had to come from a man because it was woman who was deceived first. And though we are condemned for the sin of Adam... There was a shade put on the female side of the image of God because of Eve. Mary's song, her statement, and her faith, I think, eliminates that shade that had been cast upon the female side of the image of God. When she says those words, from be, for behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. I have been part of the redemption of the image of females. And by the way, I'm not just the one telling you this, by the way. This goes all the way back to the second century with the apologist Justin Martyr, who made the first analysis between Mary's work as being redemptive to the failures of Eve. Where Eve did not trust the Word of God, Mary did trust the Word of God. Where Eve delivered disaster to the human race, Eve delivered salvation to the human race. This is not something that uh, Pastor Dave came up with, Andre. You can give me credit if you want, um, but it's been something that well established in Christian history. So Eve and, and Mary can be compared, and Mary uh, succeeding where Eve had failed, just as Jesus would succeed where Adam had failed. She goes on to say in verse 51, For his mighty deeds... Uh, he's done mighty deeds with his arms, scattered those who are proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones. He's exalted those who are humble. She's getting back now into the, um, the song of, uh, of Hannah in 1 Samuel. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servants, in remembrance of his mercy. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. Mary understands and acknowledges the great thing that God had done in her life, and she sings about it. Now, the thing that I find very also interesting about this is she mentions these different uh, elements of Deborah and Hannah. She mentions the forefathers. She mentions Abraham. And, and I don't know if this is significant to you or, or, or not, but it's just remarkable to me. The same God who spoke to Abraham who was a friend to Abraham, the same God who appeared to Moses on the mountain, the same God who walked with Adam and Eve in the garden, the same God who parted the Red Sea is now in the womb of Mary. That God is there. And He is there to such an extent that His very presence fills people with the Holy Spirit. This is the privilege that Mary bears in her. She is much more than just a helpful little girl. The privilege, the plan of God, and knowing that this is the one who would carry the Savior should not be quickly overlooked. Behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. We are called upon 
to revere and respect Mary, not escalate her beyond Scripture and make her nearly a god as, as other groups have done, but nor relegate her simply to the small efforts and things that God had done through others in Scripture. She is significant. Now, some will uh, ask the question, well, doesn't the Bible make it clear that there were people greater than Mary? Like John, Jesus talks about uh, his cousin John um, here in Luke chapter 7. He, Jesus speaking, he says, what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and one who is more than a prophet, to this is the one about whom it is written, behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. So John does this remarkable thing of, of, of getting people ready for the Messiah. And because of that, Jesus says, I say to you, among those, now I put this in myself, I put the qualifier in. Among those who are prophets, born of women, there is no one greater than John, yet he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. You almost have to have a qualifier here, because if there's no qualifier, then that would mean, because Jesus is born of a woman, right? We've already looked at that. And, and John himself says, Jesus is greater than me. I'm unworthy to untie his sandals. He must increase, I must decrease. So there's no way that John is greater than Jesus, and Jesus is born of women. So we know that there's got to be a qualifier in here. I'm not a Greek scholar. I might need some help on that. But anyways, uh, I say to you, among those, and Jesus clearly speaking of prophets, among those who have come before John to prepare the way, there's no greater than John. And the, the simple thing that comes to my mind is this. If John is the greatest prophet because he prepared the way of the Lord, what would that make Mary who prepared the Lord himself? I find it interesting in Desire of Ages, speaking of the marriage at Cana, when Mary calls upon her son Jesus to resolve the problem of the missing wine, it says this, In no wise disconcerted by the words of Jesus, Mary said to those serving at the, serving at the table, Whatever he says to you, do it. Thus, she did what she could to prepare the way for the work of Christ. Now, I don't know if it's just a, a, a coincidence, but here Ellen White uses the exact same language as, as uh, Jesus here in the work of John. Come on, little thing. Preparing the way. Spirit of prophecy says that Mary prepared the way as well. So I think she played a significant role, as significant, if not more, than even the ministry of John. Did she not prepare the Lord for ministry? Did she not do the work that God had called upon her to do? But the greatest reason that I think Mary may be the most important person to have ever lived is that she did embody the literal ideal of what every believer is called to. I find it, yeah, you got another 30 minutes, don't you? No, you don't. Do <laughs> In another time and place, this would sound very funny, but um, we'll just see how it goes. Here at Galatians, Paul says this, my children with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you. Now, I want to tell, I'll be honest with you, I've read that many times, you've probably read that, and I always just kind of assume, well, that means his character, you know, his character formed in me, or, or, or that's the, uh, his influence, you know, that's, well, that's what it means to have Christ in you. Um, so I did a little bit of research. That word is, is a unique word in the New Testament, it's only used here, but it was not an unknown word, word in the Greek world. It means pregnancy. Did you know that? It is the same word used for the formation of a child in the womb. That is the word the educated Paul used in referring to the New Testament believer. I am again in labor until Christ is growing in your womb. So that just creates this idea that the thing that God did for Mary in a literal way, God wants every believer to appreciate and experience themselves. And the, the, the little rabbit trail I'm struggling with here is, I guess today men can get pregnant. I just, it's, again, I don't mean to throw it into politics and, and all that, but we're living in a world, well, that's, that's like things people are just commonly saying. Now, I'm not suggesting this in a, in a sexual erotic way. This is just simply the spiritual reality that God wants everybody. He says, look at what I did for Mary. 
And I want you to have that too. What does it mean to have that child in you? I'm not a woman. I can imagine, but you who have been moms, of having that life inside of you, what you eat and how you treat your body affects that baby. And as believers, how we live our lives affects the image of God that is growing inside of us. Many other places, Paul will tease this out. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. If Christ is in you, it's because of righteousness. Mary was there. Mary embodies this reality of which all uh, believers can reflect back on and say, that was amazing. And God wants to do the same thing for me. Again, in Galatians, he says this one that we've heard many times sung songs about, I have been crucified with Christ, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives, where does he live? In me. In me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith, in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Now, he did give himself up on the cross, but the cross could never have happened if he didn't first give himself up from glory, give himself up from the crown, give himself up from the privilege of heaven and being embodied in a young girl, a teenager, by the name of Mary. His first time giving himself up for our salvation is when he left heaven and came inside a young girl. The process of salvation was able to produce and continue until the great work of the cross, the resurrection, the continued work of the Savior in the heavenly sanctuary. And God says this same reality can be performed in our lives today. We need to experience it spiritually. We need to appreciate it. We need to learn from the example of Mary. Mary's story establishes her as one of the greatest examples of faith and courage. She's a hero. She is a central feature. She deserves to be recognized and understood and called blessed. Her song teaches God's purpose for her raising of Christ, helped in His preparation and accomplishment of salvation. Her example of Christ in you sets a standard for all believers afterward to follow. Is Christ in you today? Because he wants to be. He wants to be in you. He wants you to appreciate his willingness to go to the greatest extremes to bring salvation to this world. He wants to be inside of you. He wants his image to be growing so that you can do as Mary did as well and produce a savior to this world. It is not a great stretch of symbolism and metaphor to understand this. Friends, is Christ in you? Have you said yes to his offer? Have you believed his word, accepted his promise? Is he growing? Is he bringing joy to those you come into contact with? Does the Holy Spirit follow you wherever you go? Because you have Christ in your heart. The Mighty One has done great things for me. And holy, holy is his name. Gracious God in heaven, thank you that we can appreciate all the great heroes of the Bible. I think we can learn from their example, both the good and the bad. Mary may not have been sinless. She was not perfect. She lived a life like we all do. But what a giant of faith. What an example. I pray that we would all look upon her life and be filled with joy. That we would look upon her courage. 
a 16-year-old, a teenager, what we would call a child. And you have done great things through her. Lord, do great things through us as well. Come, Lord. Come into our lives. Be in our hearts. Be in our minds. Be in our very existence. That we would carry you with us wherever we go. We pray in Jesus' name.